Our H&R coilovers are here. The new merch is live on the site and we're redesigning our rear suspension from the ground up. This episode's gonna be a good one. Let's dive in. Every great Stanceworks episode begins with a new box of fresh parts. Given the intro, it's no surprise that inside are our custom H&R coilovers for the 308. But these are some of my most anticipated parts for this project so far. So let's take a closer look. These one-off H&R coilovers were built specifically for the 308 project using dimensions and measurements that I provided to H&R a couple of months ago. But the wait was worthwhile because, as they say, perfection takes time. What we got in return is a set of aluminum-bodied monotube coilovers that will do everything that we ask of them. They are sprung and valved for the new weight of the 308 along with its aero package and the downforce it'll make. And they tip the scales at just 9.2 pounds per side or 18.4 pounds in total, absolute featherweights. They're also some of the smallest dampers that I've ever seen, which will fit our packaging constraints perfectly. On top of the coilovers, we've also got a slew of springs to use once we get to the testing and tuning phase so we can really dial in the suspension package of this car. But that'll come in a future episode. For now, let's get these coils installed. The front end is a bolt-in affair, made simple by the fact that we made turnbuckles as placeholders for our coilovers a few months ago. If all of our measurements are correct, it should be as simple as simply removing the bolts from this turnbuckle, removing the turnbuckle itself, and then putting the new coilover directly into place. As hoped, our bushing widths were perfect. Now it only comes down to overall length. Now keep in mind that our turnbuckles sit the car at ride height versus the coilover itself will compress with the car's weight on it. That means the control arm needs to come down just a touch, but with it dropped, the coilover slipped right into place and we can call this complete. The front coilovers are officially installed. Now let's move on to the rear of the car. I wish that I could say this was gonna be as easy as the front, but it's anything but. Let me disconnect the tow link and move some parts out of the way so I can show you the problem. The ball joint on our lower control arm is a tension ball joint. As load is placed on the wheel of the car, it attempts to pull this ball joint apart. That is, of course, opposed to a compression ball joint, which gets pressed together. You can see the stud and the cup for our ball joint here and how they get assembled. The stud is unable to pass through the front of the ball joint, which is how it carries its load. This ball joint is meant to be pulled apart, not pressed together. The front end works the exact same way, which is why we have our coilover mounted to the lower control arm. This mimics the way that a Corvette is built, which is what we're borrowing some parts from. The problem is, we've done something different in the rear end. We've got the coilover mounted to the upper control arm, and because the upper ball joint is inverted, this ball joint is also in tension. Unfortunately, I finally heard back from the manufacturer, and I've been told that this ball joint is a compression ball joint. It'll come apart if we run it this way. On top of that, there is one other small issue. If you look closely, our temporary coilover is actually angled towards the inside of the car. This would yield a falling spring rate if we were to run it this way. We could solve this problem by just moving the tabs on the control arm, and we could fix the ball joint issue by just modifying the spindle and putting a tension ball joint in place, but honestly, I'd rather solve this a better way. I want to relocate the coilover to the lower control arm, just like we have it set up in the front. That lower ball joint is a lot more stout and better suited for the loads that it needs to carry. For that, we're going to need to design some new shock mounts, so let's start with the upper shock mount. I drew this up in Fusion 360 after making some cardboard templates to figure out what's going to work. It's a very simple sheet metal part that can be made from three individual pieces and then welded together. It can get mounted to the reinforced section of the chassis that we built in a previous episode, and it makes for a somewhat simple solution. So now let's talk about the lower control arm. This dainty looking thing is what's currently in the car, and we need to beef it up considerably, which is why we're going to do this a crossbar spreader with a 3 16 plate to triangulate the entire thing, along with some tabs to actually support the coilover itself. The tabs are offset towards the back of the car because we need to clear an axle that we don't have yet. I'm playing it on the safe side and leaving a bit of room to spare. 
the last thing that we need to do is rebuild our upper control arms, because there's currently a plate welded in the middle of it, and we need a coilover to pass through it. The only problem is, we need new tapered ends for the upper ball joints, so let's pay a visit over to Brett Walker at Nimmo Machine. If you're new to the channel, you might not be familiar with Brett, but Brett is what you might call a master of all trades. I've never taken a problem to him that he hasn't been able to solve, and as such, he's been an integral part of every single project I have undertaken in one form or another. And this time, some tapered holes are going to be a cakewalk for him. These holes will require some precision machining though, so Brett whipped out his machinist handbook and then explained that these tapered holes will be measured not in degrees, but in subsections called minutes and seconds. A minute divides a single degree into 60 subsections, and a second divides each of those subsections into 60 more. Just like a circle has 360 degrees, it has nearly 1.3 million seconds, and Brett is aiming for one. Now let's be clear, it doesn't need to be that precise, but Brett doesn't cut corners. And as a result, we have two perfectly machined ball joint receivers to weld to new control arms. Now forgive the merch plug, but before we get back to fabrication, I've got to share it because I'm so pumped. We've got the new K24 and Turbo Buddies tee in black and in white, along with the Ivory Stanceworks Pentagon tee, and the balance and power design, which not so subtly blends Ferrari's prancing horse, topped by a samurai, which perfectly encapsulates everything about a Ferrari with a K24 in it. I've also got new garage banners, so head to the Stanceworks store and snag whatever you're into. Now back to work. Because I'm cramming all of this work into one episode, I had my buddy Dylan plasma cut all of the parts we designed in CAD earlier in the episode. The downside is that plasma cut parts have much rougher edges than the laser cut parts we get from send cut send. There's a lot of kerfing that's going to need to be cleaned up in order to make these parts up to snuff. Between the belt sander and my finger file, I spent roughly two hours cleaning these parts up. But even still, I can't thank Dylan enough for knocking these parts out for me. After the cleanup work, I'm pretty happy with these and I'm definitely willing to weld them onto the car. So I took our shock tower over to the workbench, got it mocked up with some one, two, three blocks and burned it in. I ran this at about 106 amps with 330 seconds tungsten and 330 seconds filler rod. And I'm pretty happy with the result, although I might've cooked it just a touch. On to the lower control arms. Here's a glimpse at what the arm looks like in its current state without any revisions or changes. The first step on the list is to mount the central gusset for the control arm. This will not only make the arm itself a whole lot stronger, but it'll give us something to mount the shock mount to. The shock mount, of course, is going to need a tube running along the backside, like I have mocked up here. After confirming that our CAD drawn tabs match our original real control arm, it's time to make a tube that will actually fit. For copes like this, it's definitely possible to use a tube notcher, but it's often quicker just to do it by hand the old fashioned way. By sneaking your way up to the cope, you can get a really nice fitment with only a marginal amount more time invested. With our rear tube in place, I mocked up the tabs and got them squared up with a few pieces of scrap metal and a clamp, and then worked my way around tacking them into place as well. We've still got a lot of finish welding to do, and one other small change to make in the future that we'll cover later, but for now, we can call these modifications to the control arm complete. Another thing crossed off the list. I don't think anyone wants to see me make more control arms at this point, so let's shortcut fabricating the upper rears and talk about the changes instead. First is that our new tube nuts are considerably longer than the ones on the old arms, so I had to account for this when cutting the new tube work. Second is the fact that these tube nuts didn't fit inside of the tubes, so I had to chuck them in the lathe and take a few thousandths off just to make it work. For the final change, you'll have to look at the drawing underneath the control arm. You might notice that the curved arm is significantly more curved this time around, and that's to give us clearance for the coilover that now needs to pass through this control arm. Thankfully, I've built enough control arms at this point that this only took about an hour to do. 
And now we've got everything that we need in order to build the rear suspension of the car, our upper and lower control arms, as well as a shock mount. So all that's left is to actually install them. The lower control arm is the same control arm that was installed before, we just extensively modified it. So it bolted right in. The upper control arm is a copy of what we had minus the shock mount, so it too is a bolt-in affair. That brings us to our new shock tower, which needs to be welded into place. Like pretty much everything else in the back of the car, we're only going to tack it for the time being, and we'll leave the finish welding for the future. So let's cross some stuff off the list. We've got the shock towers and both control arms officially installed. So let's check out the final product. In retrospect, I should have taken this approach from the beginning, but I'm really happy with how it turned out, and all of the changes are definitely worthwhile. We've got tons of room for the axle, there's plenty of room for the coilover through the upper control arm, and we've solved the problem of a falling spring rate and a potential failure at a ball joint. That means the biggest thing of the episode is now crossed off the list, the rear coilovers are now installed. But to be clear, we have introduced a few new things we have to tackle. I'm sure some of you guys have noticed that the heim joints at the back of the car are extended a little bit too far. We can easily solve this when we pull the arms off for finish welding by installing these extended tube nuts which Brett machined for us. An easy fix, no problem at all. On a similar note, I'd like to change how the control arms mount to the chassis because these original Ferrari mounts aren't that stout and that should be a simple one day fix. Most importantly though, we need to talk about this little guy the toe link mount on the spindle side. Let's take a look and I'll show you why. Because we've relocated the coilover to the lower control arm, the toe link now fouls it. It's close to clearing, but it's not quite enough, and there's no real way to fudge it. This might seem like a big problem, but it's actually an opportunity to improve our bump steer situation even further by having Brett machine an entirely new mount for the spindle. There's still a few small details in the front that we have to sort out, like the Ackerman angle and supporting our toe link mounts, but overall, the suspension on this car is largely complete. The hard work is out of the way at this point. There's still a lot of stuff left on our list before we can call this car complete in any form, but in this episode, we cross some of the biggest and most stressful jobs off entirely. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. Don't forget to like, leave a comment, or subscribe if you enjoyed this one. And of course, be sure to check out the merch if you wanna show some support or if you just like the designs. All of that stuff helps keep this channel alive, keeps this project going, and allows me to do this kind of stuff and keep making this content. And your support means the world to me in any form, monetary or otherwise. Even just those likes and those comments do so much to help this whole operation just work. And I pour so much time and effort into this and I'm rewarded thanks to you guys. So anyways, enough rambling. I've got a lot of work to do over the weekend. We'll be back next week. More progress on the Ferrari. I'll see you then. I'm tacking this at the end of the episode because it doesn't really have a place in the episode. I'm not even sure why I'm including it other than, I don't know, it's an event for me. Uh, it's currently like five in the morning. Uh, last night I finished up the control arms just to kind of give an idea of where I'm at in this process. And uh, yeah, I'm up this early because my truck alarm went totally crazy and I got up trying to figure out, oh, is that my truck alarm? And yeah, someone was trying to break into my truck and steal it, which I guess isn't surprising. It's a six liter Ford, probably the most commonly stolen easy target out there. And it's one that commands a lot of attention. But man, I'm just, I, I had a truck stolen a few years ago. I had a Land Cruiser stolen from me and it was one of the worst feelings I've ever felt. Uh, just completely violating and frustrating. And as someone who really cares a lot about vehicles, and my vehicles mean a lot to me, it sucked. And I know how it feels to have a vehicle stolen from you. And this morning, all I feel is just pure frustration and hatred. I'm lucky, I know, my car is still here. I'm, I'm really lucky, but I'm just, I hate thieves. And I hate that this is the reality of this world, that you can work so hard for something, and people just try to take it from you. And... Here I am feeling like, screw it, you know? I'll just sell it. I won't even have something fun to drive around because every time I do that, somebody tries to steal it from me. I'll just drive around a beater, you know? And it sucks because I really love this hobby and I try to sink myself into it, not 100%, but 200%. I mean, I eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff and I don't know. I'm just disheartened this morning. I'm frustrated.
This sucks. Nothing to be said about it. That's that's it. I'm just complaining, but I'm sharing. This sucks. Thieves suck. So, take an extra step. Make sure your cars are safe, guys. Guys and gals. Make sure they're locked up. Make sure you got good security systems. Kill switches, all that kind of stuff. All right. I'll catch you all next week.